This is the question of the Communist International and the woman's struggle. And if we look at the, at the approach of the Third International towards the woman's question, it was, a break, it, it, it was a break with the approach so far, both with the approach of the old Second International, but also with the more liberal petty bourgeois women's movements uh, up till then. The Third International, as it has been said uh, other days uh, this week, it was born out of revolution. The revolution in Russia and the revolutionary wave uh, throughout Europe and the rest of the world. <coughs> and this was the basis for all their policies, including on the, quest on the women's question. that the revolution and socialism, it wasn't something out in the distant future, but it was here and now, uh, as opposed to the approach of the Second International. <laughs> and that socialism was not just something that would come at some point, but it was the result of revolutionary struggle. And in this struggle, the Third International saw the participation of women as indispensable. <laughs> on the first Congress uh, of the Third International, they adopted a short resolution on the question. <laughs> and it ends with these words. It ends with these words. The dictatorship of the proletariat <laughs> can be achieved and maintained only <laughs> with the energetic and active participation of working women. <laughs> so this, this was the base. Uh, the, other, the other thing was, it was also opposed to the way the petty bourgeois and the bourgeois liberal women's movement were, were taking up this question. They saw this as a struggle for, for both men and women. But of the proletarian men and women, in a united struggle to defeat capitalism <laughs> uh, and to fight and a fight for communism <laughs> and the third international was was founded just a few years after the russian revolution <laughs> and the and in russia it became clear uh, how the revolution meant huge strides forward in the conditions for women These demands that the petty bourgeois uh, women's movement had been fighting for for decades and not really achieving anything. It was implemented immediately after the revolution in Russia. Not only the right to vote, the right to an education, uh, the right to uh, have, have a profession. There was uh, introduced full equality within the law. Uh, it was the first uh, female minister, People's Commissar, Colin Tai. They got the right to divorce, the right to abortion, a right that in many capitalist countries was not given until the 60s or 70s and are still not given in many countries.
They decriminalized homosexuality. Which was also decades before in many other countries. And they made a conscious effort to organize and mobilize women. Uh, to educate them, to raise the cultural level. But also to get them actively involved in building the new society. And as a part of that, to build the, the Bolshevik party, the communist party. And for this, to fight for this, the Third International saw the, the participation of women as, as, as necessary. <coughs> the basis for this uh, new approach, you can say, compared to the earlier approach, was first of all, like with everything of the Bolsheviks, a firm foundation in, in theory. Klaus Zetkin is, uh, is at, a, uh, at some point quoting Lenin for saying, Klaus Zetkin, has a, she is quoting Lenin. That, that Lenin told her, <laughs> we must by all means set up a powerful international women's movement <laughs> on a clear-cut theoretical basis. Uh, and, and the foundation of the Marxist approach to the women's question is to be found first and foremost in uh, Friedrich Engels, the region of the private property of the family and the state. <laughs> Which in my opinion is still to be the foundation of, of our approach. Of course some of the facts are outdated. But there are new studies that shows that in his basic argument, he is absolutely correct. <laughs> and what he states, which I think is very important for us also, Engels, in this book, <laughs> is an idea that at his time was revolutionary, and I would stay, say is still quite revolutionary for some people, that women have not always been oppressed. that it's not something uh, natural inherent in men or in women. <laughs> but that in the beginning of humanity, uh, where there was, we, we're living in what you could call <coughs> primitive communist societies. <laughs> there were equality and respect for women. It's clear this was because human labor were not able to produce a surplus. <laughs> and therefore the material basis for inequality didn't exist. <laughs> there was a division of labor of some kind. I'm sure there have been on, on the base of age and skills and so on, but also on the base of, of uh, genders. Based on the fact this is a way before contraceptives, so women would be having quite a lot of babies. But the task of women was just as important in feeding the families as the task of the men. Wow. 
Um, this, this approach, also what he says is, he, Engels describes that the family is something very different than from what it is today. You would live in communist households and you would only know for sure who the mother of a child was. But Engels explains how all this changed with the development of the productive forces. Uh, that that drives the change in the family and the position of women in society. With the development of cattle breeding, of agriculture and so on. Human labor were, uh, sorry, were able to produce a surplus, which was a huge step forward for humanity and a huge step backward for women and all those who got oppressed. Because also for the first time it would make sense to have slaves Uh, and go to war and take slaves in order to make them work for you. And from the division of labor between the genders that existed before, it was, it was the areas of work of the men who were producing the surplus, the cattle breeding, agriculture and, and war. And that changed everything, also in the family. Because suddenly uh, the man wanted to know who his children were so he could uh, pass on his wealth uh, as, as an heritage. And this overthrew the mother right. Which in the words of Engels, Oh, sorry. Sorry. Which, in the words of Engels, represented the world historic defeat of the female sex. Where the women was degraded and reduced to servitude. Uh, and this, um, we don't know exactly how this happened. But we can see how the oppression of women arise with the oppression of class. And how these two kinds of oppression are completely interlinked. From here on, women were relegated out of the social sphere. Uh, and men dominated through their economic position. And since then, we have, have, have had thousands of years where it has been seen as natural that women are inferior to men and so on. And of course, the way it has happened has changed with the society and the mode of production. And it also took on a special character in capitalism. Oh, sorry. But what Engels also explains, and this is the foundation also for our struggle of, of the third international now struggle today, is that capitalism for the first time also lays the foundation for the emancipation of women. Uh, not just of women, but of all humanity. First of all, because the material foundations are now laid for the removing of classes and inequality. Yeah. 
in relation to the oppression of women, we have now, uh, dur during capitalism, the technology has been um, developed to remove most of the housework. So we have the means now to socialize uh, all the burdens of housework that is now being done in, in all the separate families and that mainly falls on the shoulders of women. <laughs> Thank you. And secondly, and just as important, is that here in capitalism, women are again uh, dragged into social production. <laughs> and as workers, they're dragged into the class struggle and the struggle for emancipation. And out of this isolation within the four walls of, of the home. And from this follows two very important conclusions for the struggle. The fight for women's emancipation and against inequality is a struggle for a communist society. And two, that this struggle can only be carried through by the working class and only as a revolutionary struggle to overthrow capitalism. And the Third International took this very seriously. On the first Congress, they had this short resolution just uh, outlining the main foundation, saying this is a proletarian struggle to change society. In 1920, at, oh sorry, in 1920 at the second Congress, <laughs> they set up a special secretariat for work among women. <laughs> and in connection with the, with the Congresses of the Third International, they had Congresses for work among wi women, communist work among women. where reports were given at, at the Congresses of the, of the Third International uh, and theses and resolutions were adopted. <laughs> but especially the, the Third Congress in 1921 dealt with this question. Uh, on how to, how to organize the, the communist work among the women. because they saw the need to involve the broadest masses possible of working women in, in the struggle. And, and the Congress called on, on all the communist parties in the international <laughs> to set up sections attached to the party With the, with the aim, th and this is a, a quote, to engage in propaganda and uh, agitation among the female proletariat to spread the communist ideas and draw these women into the communist party. And, and I think this is something that needs to be reflected on. Why did they want to set up these special committees to, to work among women? <laughs> and uh, Klaus Atkin, she uh, explains in her report to the, to the co Third Congress of the Third International, why she thought it was necessary to organize the work, uh, special work 
to, to work among women. And this is a, a long quote, and I am sorry. <laughs> but I think she says it very well, so I wanted to quote her words. She, she starts by saying, we, that is the communists, do, do not in the slightest lose sight of the common interests and struggles of proletarian men and women. However, we are alert to the given specific conditions that communist work among women must deal with. We do not forget the social conditions that still hinders women's activity, political awakening, and political struggle in many ways. Acting through social institutions, family life, and existing social prejudice. We recognize the impact that thousands of years of servitude have, has left in women's soul and psychology. That is why, in addition to all that the organization has in common, it needs special structures special measures to link up with the masses of women, bring them together, and educate them as communists. I, what, it, what she is saying is, we have to understand that these thousands of years of oppression have le has left an impact both in the psychology of women, that makes it more difficult for them and for the parties to organize them, and it has built these social structures of family, of, um, of the church, of, of everything. That means that if, that if you just leave it to chance, you will not be as effective in organizing women as if you do something about it. And I think this is something profound that is sometimes being a bit forgotten. And something I think we also need to discuss. So what were they fighting for, the Third International? In the program it said, we fight for total equality of rights of men and women in law and practice. In law and practice. Uh, for the integration of women into pol political life We fight for free education, medical care for women, social measures to ease the burden of housework and childcare, and measures to do away with sexual double standards for men and women. I think this is quite a good program for today, <laughs> which is also a bit sad 100 years later. <laughs> but I think this is also an answer to all those who says that communists doesn't care about the, the fight for women. <laughs> A 
or try to reduce the struggle for, for, for women's emancipation to just, just an economic struggle or ma material struggle. That is also very important and the base. But as they say, it's not only that. <laughs> it's everything, it's the culture, it's the, what do they call it, sexual double standards. It's, it's all of it we need to fight. Uh, then in the thesis and resolutions from the third Congress that I will really recommend everybody to read. They go into quite some detail on how to do the work. Uh, and how in different kinds of countries, you can say. Uh, first of all, they say how to do work among women in Soviet uh, countries. And they explain the need to draw women into the construction of, of this communist society. First of all, by setting up child care, uh, dining houses and so on. But also in Russia, they set up this organization called the Senatel. 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 Yes. Yes. <laughs> um, I don't know if I pronounce it correctly. Um, which was an organization linked to the Bolshevik party with the specific purpose of uh, engaging women. They made a lot of uh, magazines for women, not like the women's magazine we know today, <laughs> but like <laughs> communist <laughs> women's magazines. <laughs> How to do your makeup. <laughs> like on serious questions. <laughs> Both questions that were related to women's struggles. but also the general struggle of the workers around the world and, and in Soviet Russia. <laughs> they made special efforts to, uh, to teach women how to read and write. <laughs> and to get them educated. <laughs> and they set up special committees uh, also locally uh, where they got the factories and so on to elect women delegates. <laughs> to discuss how to involve even more women. <laughs> and they made like internships, which I think is quite <laughs> advanced for <laughs> Russia 1918 or something. <laughs> Uh, where you could get an internship, I think it was three or six months, either in the party or in the state. In order to educate female cadres to go back and organize. Then they discuss also how to do work uh, among women in uh, economically backward countries in the East, they call it. <laughs> and I think this is an area we should uh, look into more, at least I, sh I, I would like to. I, I remember it was brought up the last time we had a similar discussion. And I think it's really amazing when you read the thesis, how, how can you say that? Um, what's the right word? Uh, not delicately, but, but how carefully they, they go to this question. Yeah. 
having a very flexible and sensitive attitude towards the problems that exist in these countries. And they describe uh, how these uh, special organs for working women should work in the East. And they say that the task of them is to fight all prejudices and all religious and secular customs that oppress women. And, and to achieve this, they must carry out this agitation among women, uh, men as well. <coughs> and then they, des they describe the work uh, for these organs in the Soviet countries of the East. And I think this can teach us a lot on the, well, I, hopefully we know, but the left wing of, of Europe today on how to deal with the religious fundamentalism and, and oppression of religious minorities. What they say is, in the Soviet countries of the East, the raising of the general cultural level of the population is, uh, is the best method of overcoming backwardness and religious prejudices. The department must encourage the development of schools for adults that are open to women. There was, a, there was a discussion inside also the Bolshevik party, I know, about how to go about this. And as far as I know, there were some who was arguing that the best thing was to encourage women to stand in the middle of the village and just take off the veil. Which, uh, if you haven't raised the general cultural level, it just meant that these women were quite isolated. But what the Third International said was, and they took, you could say, or I would say, reality as a, as a starting point. Uh, they say that uh, what, what the Department for Work Among Women should do is avoiding tactless and crude attacks on religious beliefs or national traditions. While on the other side, the departments of commissions uh, working among the women of the East must still struggle against nationalism and the power of religion over people's mind. So that is fighting religion, fighting prejudice, fighting nationalism, but doing it in a, in a sense, understanding where, where, pe where people are coming from and not just attacking them. And, and Klaas Etkin in her report on the Third Congress, she reported how at the Congress for Work Among Women just before, or the conference, a lot more women from the East uh, had participated
And she said this is what made her most happy. <laughs> and because it showed how this policy was beginning to, to work and how it was awakening women and how that was a sign uh, of, of um, revolutionary stirrings also in this part of the world. Um, then in the end, they also talk about what, is, what was the main work of the Communist Party, which was work among women in the bourgeois capitalist countries. <laughs> and, and what they say here is the main aim is to draw the women into the class struggle. to do work in the trade unions, to raise demand, all these different demands for equal pay, for example. And then to work to get the women uh, also to participate in the communist struggle and involved in the communist party. Um, yes, so they set up, especially in the Communist Party of the West, these uh, commissions to do the work. <laughs> but they, these commissions, they were for doing work among women, they were not only for women. Um, and the, the clear goal of the work was to get the women involved into the party and not just in these women's committees. Uh, and for example, this uh, thesis set says, and now I'm going to repeat uh, a quote that Fred gave the other day. But Alan always says that repetition is the mother of all learning, <laughs> so I will do it anyway. <laughs> and the thesis says <laughs> that to, in order to strengthen the comradeship between working women and working men, <laughs> it is desirable not to organize special courses and schools for communist women, <laughs> but that all general party oh sorry, but that all general party schools must without fail <laughs> include a course on the methods of work among women. And I think this is a very good approach. The, the, the women's question is not only a, a question for women, it's a question for the party. <laughs> and women should not only do, uh, how can you say, should not only be concerned with the women's question, but should participate in the schools of the party on all the questions. I think one thing we have to remember, and I think this is a general word of warning, <laughs> is I remember the first time I read them quite many years ago. <laughs> <laughs> I would read them a bit like, not the Bible, I have never been religious, but a bit like, okay, this is like the recipe for how to do things. So you read them and think this is exactly how we should do. Th these were mass parties. The, the communist parties of the Third International were mass parties. Doing work in the immediate prospect of revolution. 
we, we are not quite there yet. Ho hopefully <laughs> sometime in the not so distant future. But, but we need to have a sense of proportion when we read these things. To understand the method and the approach. And if we are a group of 70 or 100, uh, I think it would be a bit much to have special commissions for work uh, uh, on each branch level. So we read it and understand the approach and also understand our heritage. <laughs> and the main thing they say is this, <laughs> that only communism can liberate women <laughs> and only through class struggle. <laughs> and and therefore, they also drew quite a clear distinction between them, uh, the communists, and, and the general uh, women's movement. And, and they say also in these resolutions that the Third Congress of the Communist International supports the basic position of revolutionary Marxism, that there is no special women's question, and nor should there be a special women's movement. And that any alliance, alliance, between working women and bourgeois feminism or support for the vaccinating or clearly right-wing tactics of the social compromisers, that is the, the second internationalist, <coughs> and the opportunist, will lead to the weakening of the forces of the proletariat thereby delaying the great hour of the full emancipation of women a communist society will not be won by the united efforts of women of different classes but by the united struggle of all the exploited So what they're basically saying is the struggle for women's emancipation is not a struggle that encompasses all women across class lines. It's a struggle for all the oppressed classes of all genders. That might be a bit I don't think they would have said all genders. We're 100 years later now. <laughs> Men and women, they would have said. But this is the basic position. But of all oppressed, no matter gender, nationality, and so on, against the, the, the ruling class, no matter what gender they have, And that also means that the communist does not participate in this special women's movement. But see the struggle for women's liberation as part of the communist struggle, of the, of the proletarian struggle, and the communist movement. This didn't mean that they only did, that they couldn't cooperate with anybody. 
They made uh, more general uh, women's conferences. Uh, they worked in the trade unions, of course. They, they set up uh, cooperatives in order to try and draw in housewives. And of course they recognized that there are some demands that are general for all women. Like the right to vote, abortion, divorce, and all these fights for democratic demands. And this was a, a great part of, of their struggle. And something we have to remember today also. And something I think the comrades are already doing, participating in these different movements against the, how do you say that, attacks on abortion rights and so on. Uh, and we do this, first of all, because we, we fight for a better life for, <laughs> for <laughs> workers. But also because this makes it even more clear that the problem is not only or is not basically uh, the democratic rights. Lenin has a very nice quote on the, which is uh, where he's talking about the right to divorce. <laughs> he's actually talking about the national question. <laughs> but then he mentions the right to divorce. <laughs> and what he says is, <laughs> the full of the freedoms of divorce The clearer will women see, Sorry? the clearer will women see, <laughs> that the source of domestic slavery <laughs> is capitalism and not lack of rights. <laughs> and I think this goes for all kind of different <coughs> questions, not only the women's question. that the more democratic rights you have, the more clear it becomes that, that, that it's not the democratic rights that, that is the root of, of oppression. <coughs> that the roots of oppression is, is in the social structure of society. And in a country like Denmark, I think, I'm not, <laughs> I, have, I have really tried to think, I think there is no laws left that actually um, oppress women uh, or, or is making a difference between men and women. And still it's quite clear, we, we haven't, ended women's oppression, we don't have equality. They, they made a law in 1976, the equal pay law. And back then the wage gap was around 15%. and now 45 years later or something. Uh, the wage gap is still 15%. <laughs> so you can make all the laws in the world and things doesn't really change. Um, uh, 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 yes. So, so what, the, what the Third International said was, uh, 
This is a, a fight that has to be led by the proletariat. But we should try and draw in women from different uh, layers. They are also feeling the oppression in different ways. But they need to understand that it's only in the fight to change society that it, they can actually gain, uh, get rid of this oppression. Um, and I think this is very important now with all these women's movement um, and all these big strikes on the 8th of March and so on. I think this question is also something we need to discuss. <laughs> because it can seem like, like the struggle is a struggle that affects all women. But first of all, I think we have to stress the fact that the real progress, whenever there has been real steps forward for women, it was won through mass struggle. When the ruling class were fearing for revolution and the movement going further, Like, uh, like the law for equal pay in Denmark in, in the 70s. It is, it is always presented as, a, as the result of, I don't know if this makes any sense in English, but the, the, the feminist, the, the women's movement in, in Denmark were called the red stockings. The red stockings, like all stomper. And there is a very, very famous uh, action they did, where on the main shopping street in Copenhagen, they went and they burned their bras. Which makes very good pictures in the press. But what is never mentioned today <laughs> is that they actually, and I think actually it was the same day, they went to some of the factories in Copenhagen, uh, especially the factories, and back then they were very big, uh, the factories that brew beer, <laughs> a very Danish thing. Where there were a lot of women workers, <laughs> and they handed out leaflets for demonstrations and a joint struggle for equal pay. <laughs> and the and there were huge demonstrations involving the trade unions and the and the women workers. <laughs> Which is what won the equal pay uh, law. Uh, but secondly, and I think this is also important in order to understand why this is not a struggle for all women. <coughs> that at some point, the demands of the working women will go against the privileges of the women in the ruling class. Uh, now in the Danish parliament there is a, or there has been uh, some months ago, a discussion on au pair. Is, is that a, an international phenomenon? <laughs> and there are women claiming to be feminists. <laughs> oh, they are. <laughs> that is everything and nothing. Uh, saying that we need to keep this idea of au pairs, 
i.e. low paid women from third world countries uh, going to Denmark as the own, uh, being paid nothing, being slaves of these family in order to feed their family back home. because this is the only way these women can have a career. Which is correct. Their professional careers is based on the fact that they pay low paid women to take care of their kids, cook their food and clean their houses. And all the demands of these low-paid women for better work conditions, better pay, is a threat against the women in the privileged layer. A few years ago on 8th of March, I think she's the second chairman of the Danish Industrial Confederation. Uh, she, there is a woman called Stine Bosse. She is the second chairman of the Industrial Confederation. Okay. Also a great feminist. <laughs> she used the 8th of March to argue <laughs> that the top tax, that is the tax for the richest part of, of society, should be lowered, and this was the main demand for women today. <laughs> because it made them able to, uh, to get more help at home. <laughs> more help at home to free the women to do their, the rich women to do their career, basically. So what we see is that the demands of the working class women at some point comes into conflict with the interests and privileges of, of the women of, of the ruling class. <laughs> and as the class struggle sharpens, this conflict will become even sharper. And what we see every time is that in general, of course there can be a few exceptions, the women of the ruling class will side with their class and not with the, the, the majority of that gender. Yes, so this is why this is a struggle for the proletarian women. So what did the Third International do in practice? Um, they set up this communist women's movement. They published an international bi-monthly magazine. It was called Die Kommunistische Frauen Internationale. Sorry for my German. <laughs> Uh, which, had the, which came out from 1921 to 1925. It had articles on the women's movement, the women in the USSR, in the Soviet Union, and more general articles. Some of the communist, or some of the national communist parties, they also had uh, magazines targeted to female readers. For example, the Italian one the, in the Netherlands and in Czechoslovakia. Yeah. 
In general, the work of, of this uh, women's movement centered around two central campaigns. Which, which was to mobilize and build around the 8th of March, the Women's Day. And then to support the international workers' aid for Soviet Russia. But also they were involved in, in all kinds of different campaigns. In Berlin, for example, they had campaigns on inflation, the war danger, the, war, the danger of war, uh, education, uh, laws, uh, yeah, uh, the fight against fascism, the fight against anti-abortion laws. Uh, and they had quite a, an advanced slogan, I think, for this struggle. saying your body belongs to you. So they were involved in all these different... Uh, yes, so they tried to, to mobilize and recruit all these women into the, into the um, Communist International. And <coughs> We have to remember this is in the 20s. This is in the tw 1920s. So it's not like half the members will be uh, women at this time. Uh, some of the highest percentages they managed to get in Czechoslovakia and Norway, around 20%. And in countries like France and Italy, uh, it amounted to around 2%. <coughs> so it was quite clear also that they needed to do this work. In Germany and Russia, they managed to, to raise the, the percentage gradually in the 20s. to 17% in, in Germany and 14% in Russia. So they did all this work, but there were also problems. Klaus Etkin, who was the international responsible for, for this work among women, She held the report on, on the Third Congress of the Third International. And you can see from the report that she's happy, but she's also a bit um, annoyed, I would say. And, and she starts by saying, <laughs> beyond any doubt, we have registered gratifying progress during the last year. So she's happy, but mixed into our pleasure regarding these steps forward, is a measure of bitterness. Of bitterness. Oh, sorry. In most countries, the gains of communist women's movement have been achieved without support from the Communist Party. Indeed, in some instances, against its open or hidden opposition, So this also shows it's not just a rosy, romantic picture of what the Third International and the Communist parties were. Uh, 
The communist movement is not something outside of society. We are not the future society. We are humans in this society. Grown up on thousands of years of, uh, of this idea of women being inferior. So also inside the communist movement, there was a struggle to combat these prejudices. And if you read, I don't know if people, if comrades have read it, uh, Klaus Zetkin, she has this memorous, memoirs of conversations with Lenin, I think it's called. <laughs> Which I will also recommend the comrades to read. And there she explains how Lenin is really frustrated. <laughs> saying there are way too many comrades, way too many communists. <laughs> Where I think he says something like, I don't remember the exact quote, but if you scratch the surface, you will find a philister behind. who is all too happy to go home and have his wife cook his dinner. So this is, so it was clear, and I think this is also important, that, that from Lenin and, and the leadership of the Third International, they were also aware of this, uh, this struggle. and that it was a constant battle to raise the cultural level also inside the movement. <laughs> and, and Klaus Etkin makes it very clear that she has full support from the leadership of the Third International in this, uh, in this work. <laughs> so the work progressed. But it is clear, like with everything else, the degeneration of the Soviet Union set its stamp also on this work in the Third International. The Russian Revolution had made full equality in law. But they had been very clear from the beginning, the Bolsheviks, that this was only the beginning, it wasn't really, it was only the starting point. <laughs> they had made great plans. <laughs> uh, child care, communal dining houses, uh, uh, communal laundry houses and so on. <laughs> and, and their target was, to socialize housework, create a new family, and basically, and I think this is a really nice vision, Trotsky says, I think it's in Revolution Betrayed. What they said about was, for the first time, to create true human relations between humans. <laughs> Removing all the pressure and the material conditions that are just weighing on humans and are distorting human relations. <laughs> but, as but as we know, the revolution uh, took place in a backward country that remained isolated. And it is clear that you cannot remove the family or change the family or thousands of years of culture just by decree. You need the material foundations. And when people are starving, you are going to give them bread before you build a kindergarten. So they were quite far away from being able to fulfill uh, what they wanted to. 
And when the Stalinist bureaucracy came to power, Uh, one of the social bases for this bureaucracy was trying to reestablish the old family to make a full reaction within this field. Um, I don't remember if they put, if they made it, I think they made it illegal to have abortions. Yes. Uh, they made, divorce was still possible, but it was very expensive. So if you were a bureaucrat, you could have a divorce. If you were poor, well, <laughs> tough luck. <laughs> they recriminalized homosexuality, <laughs> trying to connect it both to like a bourgeois decadence, how do you say, decadence, and fascism. It's clear as the planned economy began to develop, It still meant progress for women also. Like there were much more women in, uh, in higher education and much more women scientists and so on than in, I think in any Western country. And still to this day, there are more women in Russia in, in this more scientific male dominated areas of, of science. But this, this reaction on the women's question during the Stalin's time set its stamp throughout the whole international. <laughs> Where this um, homophobia, this idea that women should have uh, many children, you got a prize for having eight children, I think it was in, in the Soviet Union uh, under Stalin. It didn't help to fight these prejudices that were already there, it just helped to reinforce them. And of course this has blackened the name of Marxism and, and Bolshevism within the eyes of, of normal people. And I think we have to understand that that is also one of the reasons why the more liberal petty bourgeois uh, women's movement have gotten so much uh, wind in their sails. But we have to understand that we have an heritage that we can be proud of on this question also. And it's the heritage from the Bolsheviks and the Third International. that were actually the first one to, to not only fight for this, but also to, um, to do it in practice. And we have to re, how, relaunch this idea into, into the struggle for women's liberation. That we are the ones who are the only ones who are really fighting for the liberation of all women. Because the only way to do that is to fight capitalism, to fight for a communist society, and to do it on the methods of the Third International. <laughs>